TPUs are hardware accelerators for machine learning. So Google has enormous machine learning models that are part of a lot of the products that everybody knows and loves and uses every day. And it can frequently take days or weeks to train these models to the high accuracy that's necessary to provide a really great user experience. And so there's a lot of interest in shortening the time that it takes to train these models and also making it possible to train much larger and more accurate machine learning models to deliver new experiences like some of the demos that you saw um, and product announcements that you saw at Google I.O. here uh, this week. Google has had TPUs, which are these custom chips for machine learning in its data center since 2015, actually. And so you interact with a TPU every time you're running a search or you're using Google Photos or I think um, Maps and several other Google products uh, have benefited from TPUs. But we have been driving to build more and more powerful systems, not just these single chips, not even just single devices, um, which you can see on display in one of the tents here, but these whole supercomputers that we call TPU pods that, as Sundar announced in his keynote, the latest third version TPU pod uh, can deliver over 100 petaflops of machine learning compute. Now, it's hard to put that number in context, but the fastest supercomputers in the world can only do slightly more operations than that per second. It's not quite apples to apples because of some subtle details about the mathematical precision that we use, but the fact of the matter is these are really fast, really powerful supercomputers that are useful for machine learning. And maybe I can put that in a broader context. So the way to think about this, at least the way I think about this, is that there's a transformation happening in computer science. Traditionally, programs have been written line by line by expert humans. So you end up with these very complex programs, hundreds of thousands of lines, millions of lines of code, and those are the programs powering most of the applications that you use today, whether they're in the cloud or on the web or on your phone. What we're in the early stages of now is this transformation where those traditional computer programs are going to be augmented with programs that are learned from data. And so fundamentally, that's really what's driving all this interest in hardware acceleration for machine learning. Suddenly, instead of writing code, you're collecting a data set, you're labeling it very carefully often for image recognition, for example. Imagine labeling, this is a photo of a cat, this is a photo of a cat, this is a photo of a dog, and you get a million examples of cats and dogs, and then suddenly you can train what's called a deep neural network to distinguish between them. And then that's useful for so sorting photo collections in these products like Google Photos. And so all of that training and then all the running of the models to support billions of users requires a lot of computation. And so that's the computation that we are trying to make more efficient by building these new chips and systems and supercomputers from scratch that we call these TPUs. And it's not just for Google either. We've we've made our second generation system available in the cloud as cloud TPUs. And so that's something I'm personally really excited about is sharing this hardware with the world so other people can build their own applications on top of it. It's definitely the same product, but we've really put a lot of energy into integrating it with the rest of Google Cloud. So, you know, if you come to Google Cloud, you've got everything from low level building blocks like virtual machines, you know, and storage and databases all the way up to these very high level managed services and APIs like AutoML or the, the vision and speech and translation machine learning APIs. And so what we're trying to do is bring in this low level building block, which is the cloud TPU, but then connect it to all these other services. For example, to Kubernetes to make it easier for people to manage clusters of machines with accelerators, right? Or, um, incorporating it into Cloud Machine Learning Engine for folks who want more of a managed experience when they're training their machine learning models. So uh, these TPUs are tightly connected with the rest of cloud. So you can use Google Cloud Storage to feed large data sets in and process them with the TPU when you're training. Um, but fundamentally, it's the same hardware. And it's also the same software that you run on top of the TPU. So, these TPUs today are programmed with TensorFlow, which is our open source machine learning software 
it's the most popular machine learning framework and you can run it anywhere on premise, on your phone, on a Raspberry Pi, in the cloud, in any cloud. Um, but we um, try to do our best to make sure that TensorFlow also runs really well on these cloud TPUs um, so that you can develop a model or, you know, elsewhere, you know, take a model that you have today and then either adapt it for the TPU or pick up one of our new reference models that accomplishes the same task, but maybe in an even more efficient and accurate way. And then that's open source as well, and you can use that as a starting point for further development. So you could take something already built and adapt it for the TPU. Right, so for example, Two Sigma is one of our customers that's publicly spoken about using cloud TPUs. And um, they've already had models in-house that are implemented with layers and estimators and the, the high-level TensorFlow APIs that are naturally suited for the TPU. And so they found it quite straightforward, I think, to adapt um, their existing model for the TPU. The same APIs that I'm talking about here, the layers and estimators and so forth, once you've expressed a model at that level, you can run it on the TPU and it'll run really well and you can scale it up and down into these pods, but you can also um, run that model on GPUs or on other platforms. You can take it with you out into the world. So it's possible that over time, you may want to use lower level APIs to optimize even more closely for the TPU if it's, if it's really important for you to squeeze out the last ounce of performance. But we're really trying to provide people a programming model with TensorFlow that allows you to take models, express them at a high level mathematically, and then train and run them on a variety of different platforms. I think what we're witnessing now is this Cambrian explosion of new experiments in computer architecture, which I think is just fantastic because ultimately people don't just want 50% more compute than they have today. They want a million times more compute than they have today. So I think the more experiments we can run to figure out, well, what is the right computing platform for this new tidal wave of machine learning applications, the better. And so it's not just these giant tech companies either. There are plenty of startups that are trying interesting new architectures. And so I think Google, on the one hand, wants TensorFlow, which is open source, to run well everywhere on all of these platforms. And then in that same domain is trying to make sure that Google Cloud is a great place, ideally the best place, to run all these machine learning workloads. And um, we really encourage people to mix and match and test their own workloads you know, on their own hardware, on other hardware, on our cloud, and see what works best for them. My sense is the field is moving so fast that there's not going to be one true solution for every application, at least not in the near term. I think it's really going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, one thing that we really have, though, tried to emphasize is reproducibility of performance measurements. So you shouldn't have to believe us that we say, oh, our accelerators are crazy fast. We instead open source these implementations that you can run on your own today. You just start up a cloud TPU and reproduce the results that we talk about. But then you can also try to reproduce those same results on other platforms. You know, train a given model to the same accuracy. Can you get to the 76% accuracy on ResNet 50? Or do you top out at 75, right? These differences may not matter for some applications, but if you're doing, if you're an autonomous driving company and you're building a pedestrian detector, then it really matters a lot to get the most accuracy that you can. And so, again, I think on an application by application basis, people are gonna have to do their own tests, but we really try to do as much as we can to make the raw materials available for them to do those evaluations accurately. And then we try to help people understand that you need to measure not just raw performance, but this combination of performance and getting to the final goal that you actually want. This this accurate model that's going to enable you to accomplish your goal with your application or your, your research project. The best contest that we've seen has been the Stanford Donbench competition that recently concluded. The organizers of that, I think, did a really good job of specifying, okay, let's measure time to accuracy. Let's also measure cost to get to a certain accuracy on the public cloud. And they left the model architecture open. So this is for training. They also had benchmarks for inference that are interesting as well, and we can talk about those in a second. Because TPUs can do both, although right now they're best suited for training and for batch inference. I think over time they'll get better at low latency inference as we continue to improve the software stack. 
Um, so on the ImageNet training cost challenge, Cloud TPUs won the top two positions. First with a uh, custom architecture called AmoebaNet that we actually evolved on the TPU. So this was a really cool intersection of research that we're doing that's open source and this new hardware platform where the model architecture was actually developed from scratch by running a large population of different models and testing them on related tasks. And so then, ultimately, now that's open source today, folks can look at the code and run it on cloud TPUs or elsewhere. And uh, that made it possible to reach the Dawn Bench target accuracy for ImageNet image recognition for less than $50, which I think is really affordable compared to the thousands of dollars it used to take to run these kinds of large-scale experiments on any hardware. And so then, the second entry was also ours with a more standard ResNet 50 architecture. And, um, and then there was a really nice third place submission from a nonprofit organization called Fast.ai. Uh, then on the raw training time benchmark, we used half of one of our TPU pods, our last generation TPU pods, and that brought the training time down from hours to just 30 minutes. And so I think on both axes, um, different customers, different entrepreneurs, different researchers and artists and everybody else who's interested in the cutting edge of machine learning will have different set points of what makes sense for them. You know, some very large companies working with large data sets are interested in, in training and iterating as fast as possible. And for them, even the largest pod is still not large enough. They, they want us to go bigger, right? As we are with the, the version three that we revealed here. Um, in other cases, one of the single cloud TPU devices that you have today, that's 180 teraflops, that's already a great sort of personal workstation for machine learning. And then you can get real work done for, you know, $50 rather than thousands. So um, on the inference side, I think it's interesting to measure both, um, you know, throughput and cost of batch inference, where let's say you have a very large collection of satellite imagery that you need to process in some way to, to stitch together and learn something about the Earth. That's kind of a batch problem. You don't care about how quickly you get the results. You just need to process them inexpensively. Whereas if, on the other hand, you're doing a speech recognition application and there's a user waiting on the other end, you, you really want to get those responses back quickly. And that's where I think you really want to pay a premium for low latency inference. So we're interested in all of these. you know, And, and with the TPU, we're covering more and more of these applications over time across images and speech and machine translation and image generation and more. Um, but the whole space is evolving very rapidly. There's 50 papers published every day with new results. So uh, I think it's great for people to try all the different experiments on all the different platforms. We, we think that the TPU hardware is very flexible across this wide range of machine learning models that require dense linear algebra. So, you definitely don't necessarily want to run a full operating system on the TPU. There are other platforms that are much more suitable for that. But um, for everything that we're seeing at the state of the art in machine learning across these different domains that I mentioned, from image recognition to object detection to um, machine translation or text prediction, where you're trying to figure out the next word or sentence or phrase, or even question answering or image generation, in all these cases, we found internally and through these open source reference implementations that it's possible to use these TPUs really effectively and affordably. Uh, but like I said before, the field is moving extremely quickly and people are doing new exploration in all directions. And so it's entirely possible that someone will invent some new model that uh, requires a completely different kind of primitive, in which case you'd want to develop a a new type of specialized hardware that has that primitive built in. If you go to g.co slash cloud TPU, that takes you to the cloud TPU homepage. There's a get started button that lets you start up a cloud TPU and connect it to a virtual machine on Google Cloud Platform of whatever shape or size that you want. And so then the question is, all right, great. I'm set up, I'm ready to go. Now, how do I actually use this thing? Well, we've provided these open source reference models to help make it easy for people to get started. So these models are installed on the machine images that you use when you get set up, so you don't even have to download anything. 
but they're also available as open source on GitHub in the TensorFlow repository. There's a TPU directory. And uh, there's also a Tensor to Tensor open source project that's focused more on sequence models that's kind of built on top of sensor, TensorFlow but has a separate repository. So there are some TPU models there too that are especially great for uh, researchers at the cutting edge. So what these models allow you to do is accomplish a goal. For example, if you're interested in, in classifying small images and understanding what's in them, like we were talking about previously, um, you might use AmoebaNet or um, ResNet 50 or ResNet 101 or ResNet 152. You know, all of those are just built right in as open source reference models that you can read the code, run it on the TPU, you get high performance for free, and uh, you can modify the code as much as you want. Um, if you're interested in object detection, we've got a model called RetinaNet that uh, can train to very high accuracy on this benchmark data set called COCO. So that's a great starting point if you're doing autonomous driving or medical imaging, or you're working with photo collections and you want to detect multiple objects in a photo and really understand what's there, or maybe find a particular object and localize it. But we've also got reference implementations for speech recognition, or translating from one language to another, or some of these more far out research use cases. And so we're really trying to get to the point where it's easy to get to the state of the art, it's affordable to get to the state of the art, and either incorporate that into your application, or build on that, modify it, and extend it, and do something new that's never been done before on these cloud TPUs. I'm in research, but my impression that is that Google Cloud wants to be the best cloud for machine learning. And that means offering all of the greatest hardware, software, APIs, whatever a top machine learning user is going to need to build a fantastic production application, to do research, to achieve something that hasn't been done before, we want to make sure that that's available on Google Cloud. So I think you're going to see cloud supporting as we do today, you know, the best CPUs, the best GPUs, the best that we have to offer in TPUs, um, and then also a variety of different software frameworks and APIs on top of that to try and make it as easy as possible for people of all experience levels to get involved with machine learning. If you're, if you're an expert that absolutely wants maximum flexibility and control, that's absolutely who we have in mind for these cloud TPUs. But with the reference models, if you're a developer who's just getting into machine learning, you follow the instructions and you can train an image recognition model and build an application around it. So cloud TPUs span part of the spectrum, but we're also going to be pushing performance at the very top of the stack with APIs like AutoML, where you just bring a labeled data set for your use case and AutoML does the rest for you. They're starting with vision, but they're also expanding into other domains as well. So it's an exciting time. It's, it's I think, the beginning of this big S-curve of progress in machine learning that's going to open up all kinds of new applications and ultimately touch every product or service or experience that we have today.